I have great pleasure in um, introducing us to somebody who will be uh, with us this weekend. And uh, here in the OFNC, we are conscious of a great God. Not so much great men or women, but a great God. Okay, so that's where our emphasis is. We may clap, we may applaud, we may congratulate ourselves. But our focus is on God. So we thank God today that we have Pastor Doug Williams, who will be sharing with us at the moment. And uh, I've known him for many years because, by the grace of God, uh, he has been the senior leader of the church that my wife and I have been in uh, for many years. We've served together. So uh, we thank God for the opportunity that we've got a quality person who the Lord has used in many ways. Uh, he's a very humble man himself. He did embarrassed if I talk more about his accolades. So I won't. Okay? I won't. But well, let us now invite Pastor Doug Williams to share with us the word of the Lord that uh, has laid on him today. Please give him a welcome as he comes. For that, that wonderful welcome. Guys, would you, would you do me this favor of just standing to your feet for, for, for just another few seconds? Would you mind? I, I don't need that one yet. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. You know, on the last uh, week of Jesus' life, he came into Jerusalem and uh, he was riding on a donkey. In fact, the reception that appreciated him and uh, applauded him when he came was so disturbing for the religious leaders that they requested that the children particularly didn't do it. And he said, well, if they keep quiet, even the very rocks on the street would recognize me and respond. And they did, they worshipped him, they clapped, they shouted. It was an exciting moment. I think it would have been incredible for the donkey on which Jesus was riding to think that all that commotion was for him. Would have been ridiculous. So thank you for your appreciation. Uh, for me stepping on the platform, but this is just the donkey. I want you to put your hands together one more time, and this time in honor of the one who really deserves it. I mean, who really deserves it. Who really deserves it. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray for those who are standing, those who understand under the sound of my voice this evening that the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of our heart. Paul prayed that the church at Ephesus would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, that the eyes of their hearts would be absolutely flooded with light, that they would know what is the hope of the calling to which you have called them, the rich inheritance inside every saint. And to understand with increasing clarity that the same power that raised up Jesus from the dead is working in them. It requires a revelation. And this evening, all of the things that we talk about will require an equivalent revelation. So flood the eyes of our hearts and our minds, which can be crowded with all kinds of concerns as we draw to this weekend. There are lots of issues that we have left and things which are not yet concluded that will have our attention by the time this meeting is all over. But we're praying that there will not be distraction, destruction, derailment or distress caused by all of those things that that pull for our attention but we will be able to focus with great clarity on all the things that you wish to speak to us that we will hear you speak to every heart speak into every life and let people understand the incredible favor and great kindness with which you deal with every heart father we ask these things in the precious name of the lord jesus christ and everybody said Amen. You may take your seats one more time. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. It's good to be with you. And I am thrilled uh, at the theme. My sheep hear my voice. I just want you to understand the power of this particular statement found in John's Gospel, chapter 10. My sheep, Jesus said, hear my voice. And if you are a member of the flock of Christ, then hearing God's voice is something that's your privilege. 
It isn't for the uh, sort of, you know, elevated few who can hear the voice of God, some, some, some very anointed prophetic voice or personality, some gifted pastoral leader, some wonderfully skilled apostolic voice and leader in the body. No, no, it's, it's for everybody. Jesus said, my sheep will hear. There isn't any question about it. And so coming to this meeting, I said, God, well, why is it then, if, if it's such a privilege and such an open promise for your people to hear your voice, how come they don't hear it as clearly as I wish they did? And the issue for people hearing God's voice is not that they don't hear it, it's that sometimes they don't recognize what it is exactly that they're hearing. They hear him. You hear him. But you haven't become fully cognizant or comfortable with the sound of his voice. It gets confused with every other noise that you're hearing. And I'm praying that this weekend, a great clarity will come to your heart and mind regarding what you hear. That you will understand him and you'll be able to hear him very, very well. I, several years ago, obviously at school, uh, I love music. And I loved playing music. I played a couple of instruments and I still do. I really enjoyed that. And I was at uh, the school and I, I, I put some of this in an article for your magazine. But I want to start here as my launch pad for these couple of days that we are together. I was in the music class. And the music teacher walked in and said to the class, we are doing something a little unusual today. Because I want you to identify various instruments that play in an orchestra. Some of them are a little obscure. They don't always... Uh, they're not always profiled in their own, in their own right in the orchestra. They, they, you may not have heard of them. He said, well, here's one of the instruments that I want you to be aware of. And it's the oboe. Does anybody in the room play the oboe? Does anybody understand that instrument? Have you heard it? Are you comfortable with the sound of it? And no, none of us put our hands up. He said, listen, I'm going to play you a piece of music. And what I would like you to do is to raise your hand when you hear that instrument, is that okay? And everybody went, okay, okay, whatever. So he played a piece of orchestral music. I had no idea what I was listening to. I looked around the room. Nobody had any idea. Nobody raised their hand. Nobody responded. So he said, so nobody heard the oboe. But it was playing in the passage that you were listening to. So over the next few weeks, he said, we, we've got some work to do to help you understand this. There was a teacher who played uh, an oboe, uh, a very gifted teacher. I didn't even know that this particular individual, another individual teaching on staff, could even do this. But he came to our music class. He was a maths teacher. He came to our music class and played an oboe solo. That exquisite, rather exotic, eerie-sounding instrument. He played it brilliantly. I was like, wow, I didn't even know the guy could do this. Amazing. And over the next few weeks, our music teacher played us a variety of different expressions of contexts where the oboe played on its own and with a small company of other instruments, sometimes playing the lead, sometimes playing the harmony that would support the melodic interests of that passage. It was, it was an interesting couple of weeks. And then he came one day and said this. I'm going to play you the same piece of music that I played at the beginning of these studies. A piece of music that none of you could respond to. And I'm going to ask you again. If you hear the sound of an oboe, would you raise your hand? He played that passage of music again. I recognized it. I said, oh yeah, I, that's the song that we, was played several weeks ago. But this time I could hear a distinct tone in the midst of everything. I raised my hand. I would say that at least 90% of the people in the room raised their hands. They recognized the sound. And I went, wow, that's a lesson for me. A lesson that I will never forget even while I'm here now ministering to people and serving as a leader in the body of Christ, because I realized that as we began to focus 
on the sound of that instrument, in isolation from everything else, suddenly I developed the capacity to hear that sound anywhere. I just needed to focus in. In fact, I had been hearing it before. Even in that same passage of music, I had been hearing it, but I didn't know what I was hearing. I couldn't give it uh, the recognition that it deserved. And that's my concern with the people in this room. When it comes to hearing the voice of God, you have been hearing him. He speaks clearly. His sheep can hear him, but they haven't spent the time to recognize that voice enough. And as a result, they can't put their hand up when he speaks. I want you to be able to hear him in the orchestra of life. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever noises are around your life, whatever sounds you're hearing that speak to your mind and your spirit, you would be able to discern with absolute clarity the sound of his voice when he speaks. You'll need to do that. You'll need to be able to do that. Our culture has become a very strange place to live. Our churches have become very strange places to live. I have the privilege of going to a number of different contexts and churches. I was, uh, I still am in the denomination called the Assemblies of God and I had responsibility for a number of churches across London and have responsibility for churches in and outside of the city that I live. And I'm walking into churches today and somehow something has shifted. Even with some of the teachings that I hear on TV or on the radio, I'm finding myself greatly disturbed at what I hear because I don't recognize the tone of the voices that claim to be saying, this is what God is saying. And so somehow or other, it's time for us to dig a little deeper and take another look at what it means to hear God's voice because our, our culture is changing. I'll never forget turning on the uh, internet one day and, and watching a presentation by a friend of mine. I've known him preach for many, many years. I worked with that apostolic team and they, I befriended him, his team members and uh, went on ministry and preached in their churches. And, and this, this guy is now a liberal theologian. He's a liberal theologian because he's, his challenge was this. His daughter decided that she wanted a lesbian lifestyle. And her same-sex attraction would require her to marry a wife. Which she did. And she asked her father if he would conduct that service for her. So he wore vestments, he wore religious clothing for the day. A, a long gown, a long flowing outfit. And jokingly said, would you look at this? These two ladies are wearing their jumpers and their jeans and I am the one in a dress. But I married them because I wanted my daughter to be happy. And then he said this. This was the most chilling thing I heard. He said, you see, I have come to the place where I don't think I could worship a God who doesn't affirm same-sex attraction." I, I sat in it. I see. I see. I can't believe this. What, what has shifted? I knew what this man preached. I knew what that network believed. I knew what they were committed to. And I was like, what are they projecting in terms of the God they say they know? I don't understand it. I have no idea who that is. I have flipped to other places where I worked with well-known ministers from America, and they're teaching on prosperity and how God's people prosper disturbed me greatly. It seemed as if somehow the God they worship was like a slot machine. If you put enough in, you'll get enough out. And the kind of mechanistic way in which they responded to God disturbed me. I think I may have been the only person in the room who voiced that concern. And I don't care if I'm the only person in the room. But I voiced the concern that this kind of teaching, this kind of theology has shifted us away from truth. 
It, it has left us in a very vulnerable state. It has made the church consumeristic and very materialistic in terms of what we get out of God and how we treat God. I went, no, no, we, we, we need to recalibrate. I'm not hearing the sound of the oboe in this. I'm not discerning what God is saying. That's being valid through these things. And so I had a big, big concern for the church. I went into different worship services. I'll, I'll spare you some of the details. But, but I began to watch what was happening in church worship and discovered that those activities were more about us than about him. I judged the service not so much on how God was blessed, but how blessed was I. I say, if I come out of a worship service and I feel blessed and God has touched me in some way, do you know that's a bonus? That's not the focus and the purpose for the gathering. The focus for the gathering is to lift up his name, to honor his purposes, to applaud his doings. And I want the church to get back to putting Jesus in the spotlight. Not the dexterity and the acrobatic singing or the skills and dexterity of our musicians. I love it. I love musicians who play skillfully. I love singers who sing well. But it's not about you. There was a worship leader who thought it was about him. He had a unique and exquisite position. His name was Lucifer. But he became enamored with his gift. You know, it actually says that in his creation, there were tabrets and pipes. When that angelic creature moves, he makes a sound. He has the capacity to do that. And the attention and the attraction that he was able to precipitate through his gift was something that he wanted then to deflect for himself. I want to have a throne just like God's. I want to have a position of authority. He moved inside the very stones of heaven. He moved in the Eden of God. That's what the scriptures tell us. He had access and he knew that worship gives you access to certain things. That's why he said to Jesus, worship me and I'll give you access to all the kingdoms of the world. You can have it all. He showed him those kingdoms in an instant. Do you know what that means? It means that the enemy of our souls gave Jesus a vision. If the devil can give Jesus a vision, what can he give you? So you need to know that you can hear from God and you're able to discern the sound of his voice as clearly as Jesus was able to discern the sound of his father's voice in the conversation he had with Satan. Even when Satan used his father's words, he knew it wasn't his father's voice. I am really concerned that just like my teacher, he wants us to hear the sound of the oboe. I believe that I'm, I'm, I'm standing here tonight to talk to you and say, I want you to be able to hear God's voice clearly and understand when he's speaking to you how to, to, to hear that voice with a sense of assurance. I want to tell you, I, I have a concern. One of the things that, uh, listening to the voice of God and when God speaks, one of the things that will become clear is the emphasis and the focus on which that voice leads you. It will lead you to an understanding of the will of God. The will of God. When Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, the, 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 the implication of the original language is that they will listen with attention and will heed what's being said. It's not a question of just listening. Hearing means you understand clearly what's been spoken. And you are able to act on that. That's what Jesus meant. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. There's an action required that's appropriate to what you think you're hearing. And I want God's people to get back to the place where they can hear him and know what he's really like. 
Friends, we are in a church structure that has lost an understanding of who God is. I told you that when I first opened my pages before you. And so tonight I want to just briefly walk through this. Because we've lost an understanding of what it means to walk in the will of God because we've lost an understanding of what it means to, to know God for who he's like. We've got a God now who has become, in the eyes of most people, soft and fluffy, like a fairground toy. They don't understand what he's like and that his directives are not just an opinion or a suggestion, but he requires complete and utter obedience to what he, requ he, he speaks. He doesn't play. He doesn't play in such a way that if people don't do what he says, they can lose their lives. When you pray, your kingdom come and your will be done, do you actually know what you're saying? I want the will of God to be done in my experience. I want to know what he's saying so that I can, I can act appropriately towards those things. Friends, I, I, I want to say most Bible commentators explain the fear of the Lord as just respect and reverence for his person and his wisdom. And there's no doubt in that truth. And I hope that my next few comments certainly don't diminish that aspect of truth and that dynamic of truth. However, there is biblical evidence that fearing God contains the warning that the threat of his discipline and judgment are not to be ignored. God is our father, but he is not a sugar daddy. He's not. I want you to hear the words of Jesus who said this. <laughs> In Matthew 10 verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Don't be afraid of those who can kill your body, but not your soul. That's midway through the sentence. Can I ask you to answer this question for me? If you're afraid of somebody who has the capacity to kill your body, how do you feel? What emotions would be going through your heart and mind if you have fear of somebody who has the capacity to destroy your body? How would you feel? Okay. Are you thinking it through? Okay. Because Jesus hasn't finished his sentence there. He says, don't be afraid of the people who could kill your body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather, but rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. When he uses the word, don't be afraid of those who can only kill your body, but be afraid of the one who can kill body and soul. The word afraid is exactly the same word. Don't be afraid of these, but be afraid of one who can do this. And you don't understand that he's pointing to God the Father, who has the capacity to destroy both body and soul in hell and cause people to be ushered out of his presence eternally. We don't like to talk about a God like this. Now, he doesn't come into our presence with a chest swaggering arrogance saying, this is what I'm capable of doing. God never announces himself or presents himself that way. But just because he doesn't, it doesn't mean he can't. It just means that's not how he presents himself. But his capacity for doing that is there. When we talk about gentle Jesus or a God who's meek and mild, meekness is not weakness. It means to be tamed. It is strength under discipline. You can tame a horse, but it never loses its power. You can tame a lion, but it doesn't lose its strength. Tamed is what meekness means. Our God doesn't fly off the handle. He has the strength to destroy. He doesn't do that indiscriminately, but he has the capacity to do it. You need to know what he's like. And this weekend, I pray that you find him for what he's like because we have forgotten what he's like. We have forgotten what he's like. 
to the point where James 2 verse 19 to 20, he says this, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Well, good for you. For even demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Can't you see that living inappropriately is useless? Even when you claim to know God. Great, he says. You've ticked off the theological box about what you believe about God. But it doesn't change your behavior. Even demons say they believe in God. And they tremble with fear at the, at the acknowledgement of that truth. But still, they won't serve God. That's like so many in our churches who claim that they know God. But when did they last tremble? When has it happened in our churches last that our understanding of who God is has brought such gravity to our spirits that we tremble? I will not forget getting ready for an evening worship service in a Baptist church one year. And as we were worshiping and getting ready with the young people, the presence of God came into that room. I, I, I can remember the afternoon. And I, we were singing. There was a group here preparing some dramas and readings. There was a room full of young people. And somehow that growing sense dropped into the room. And I stopped singing. I said, does anybody sense that? But before I could really speak to anybody else, those young people were on their face confessing sin. They were weeping. I remember watching one young girl trembling. I said, oh my God. And in that moment, I could, I could feel my heart beating in my chest. I said, my God. I never experienced this in church. Nobody told me that this is this is what it was supposed to be all about. He was like this. Those young people couldn't care less who was listening. Somehow they came under such a deep conviction. The righteousness of God. They wept. And I consoled them. This happened. This took at least 25 minutes, 30 minutes. This sense, intense sense of the presence of God that made us tremble. And we huddled together and we vowed to live a holy life and serve him appropriately. And we went to do the worship that evening. And I, and I remember being on the platform leading the worship. And while we were in the middle of song, a lady got out of her seat. She was under the balcony. She got up out of her seat. She walked down the aisle. And I thought, what's she doing? She, she's going to walk to the platform. She stopped halfway down the aisle. She turned around and looked up at the balcony. Shook her head and went back to her seat. I didn't understand what she did, why she did that. But we carried on, we led the worship. It was such a wonderful sense of the Spirit of God. And at the end of the service, she came to me. She said, what happened to you young people today? I said, what do you mean? She said, What's ha what, what happened to you guys? I said, no, we were just rehearsing and getting ready for the evening. She said, no, no, something happened to you. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm sitting in the back of the church and I'm looking at your faces and they glowed like a gold ring around your heads. I said, really? She said, I said to myself, oh, okay, they've put some lights in the balcony that are shining on these lives. I said, really? She said, that's what I thought. So I came to check. And when I didn't see it, I said to myself, something has happened. I'm seeing something supernatural. She said, I don't know, Doug. And she called the young people. She said, I don't know what Doug and you other young people I've done this afternoon. But wherever it is you've been in God, stay there. Amen. Stay right there. Because you encountered something genuine. And I said, well, we confessed our sins. We trembled in the presence of God. I believe that we heard him speak to us. She said, I believe it too. And we got serious. We got serious. If demons can tremble, then Christians should definitely be doing so. 
when you look at who God the Father is, I want you to consider the following things about God that you may not have considered. But when God the Father can move in acts of discipline and power, I want you to reflect on the death-dealing waters of Noah's flood because of the social disorder and the sinfulness of humanity. And the people who died in the flood did so because God did it. The fatal fire on the brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah, if you read through the text appropriately, you'll see that that happened because of their sexual deviance and because of the exploitation that they made towards the poor. That's why their destruction happened. God did it. I want you to look at the, the devastation that fell on the sons of Judah, of Ur and Onan. It says Ur was a wicked man and God killed him. And the responsibility in that tradition was that it, then the next brother would, would raise up children in his brother's name. He would take the wife in and they would have relationships and family. And he would raise up seed in the light for his, for his deceased brother. Onan had the responsibility to do that for Ur, but he didn't want the responsibility of raising the family. But he wanted access to the intimacy that that marital relationship would give him. He did everything in his power to stop the woman being inseminated for children. And the Bible says God killed him for his irresponsible behavior. That was the God you worship. Did you know that? When God was prepared to kill Moses, do you remember that? He was called to go back to Egypt. He was going to go and lead the people. And it says, actually, that on his way back to Egypt, he was at an inn in Exodus chapter 4. And it says clearly in the text, and God met him to kill him. And while he is dying, and I don't know, there was no description of what was happening to Moses in that moment. But something was happening, and his wife knew what was required. So Porah quickly circumcised her sons. And when the, excuse the graphic nature of this, when that surgical operation took place and the foreskins of her son touched the heel of Moses' foot, he was relieved. And she said to him, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. I didn't want to do this. I wasn't keen on this, but God had said, in Hebraic tradition, that anybody who isn't circumcised, any Jewish male who refuses to do this, will find themselves cut off from this people and under the discipline of God. I don't know if anybody's ever preached this to you, but there it is in my Bible. I can't deny it. God was going to kill Moses. That's the God you say you worship. The drowning of Pharaoh's army because of the oppression, cruelty, and slavery that they placed on that nation. And they died in the waters of the Red Sea. The death of Aaron's sons in Leviticus 10, who were told by their uncle Moses and their father Aaron what God required of those who would serve at the altar. And they offered what the King James Version calls unauthorized fire. Their worship was deficient. Their worship was not what God required. And as a result of their deficient worship, just giving God what we think is okay, they lost their lives. And when Aaron was so concerned, he began to complain to Moses. Moses said, hush up. He's listening. You and I know, Aaron, that God must be considered and treated as holy by those who come near to him. Your sons brought this on themselves because of the inappropriateness of how they treated God. I told you he is our father, but he's not a sugar daddy who can be played with. And it's about time the church knew what he's really like and how awesome he is. You've got the death of Korah and Dathan and Abiram and the rebels of Numbers chapter 16 who rebelled against spiritual leadership and felt they could do their own thing. They lost their lives. Or a plague that killed 24,000 people at the Bale of Peor in Numbers 25 because of the spiritual adultery and sexual compromise of that nation. They were weeping and wailing because they'd been seduced to go across to the Bales. And they had forsaken Yahweh. And while the people are so concerned and broken, there was a prayer meeting as they gathered at the tent of meeting. Cosby and Zimri came through. A leader's daughter 
from the, uh, the Amorites and, 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 and a leader's son from Israel. And they went down to their tent to engage in acts of intimacy. And, and they shouldn't have been engaged that way. They, were, they, they served different gods. This isn't about intercultural marriage. This is about a spiritual compromise. And one of the priests, Phineas, said, this is incredible. Here we are weeping and crying before God over the sins of the nation, and they're acting as if it doesn't matter. And you don't like the story. Maybe you wouldn't put this in your daily devotion, but he took a spear. He went down to the tent where they were, and while they were in the, in the act of intimacy, he killed them both. He put a spear through the man's back and pinned that woman to the ground. Killed them both in one blow. And God went. Well done. At last, somebody is taking me seriously. Your name, Phineas, is going to be remembered for this act. As one who became incensed enough to say, this cannot continue. This isn't anything to do with hearing his voice and living inside the will of God. Where have we gone? And I know some of you are going, well, thank God. That's in the Old Testament. That's all behind us. Really? In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 to 30, it says this, So anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That's why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are drinking God's judgment upon yourself. This is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. Was the Apostle Paul right to say such a thing to the church? You don't understand what you're doing. You've come around the things of God, but this is so superficial. It's so unrealistic. You haven't understood the gravity of who you are dealing with. The awesomeness of his presence. That literally just walking into his presence nonchalantly could cost you your life. Do you know who you're dealing with? Wow. When Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2 verse 22, so I will cast her, this is a false prophetess in the church, I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. He's speaking to the church. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Revelation 3 verse 5 is Jesus who said, All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. I read that phrase and a chill went through my spirit. Jesus said, I will never erase their name from the book of life. Why would you say that, Jesus, unless doing so was a possibility for you? Why would you say, I'll never erase a name? From the book of life. Can he erase a name from the book of life? Like I told you, we've been given a lot of teaching in the body of Christ and we have to go back and recalibrate. Is this projecting and presenting to us the God who really needs to be worshipped? Of course, I don't believe that you can lose your salvation. Something so mindless and negligent isn't happening. But can you apostatize? Can you choose to say, I'm not following anymore? I'm walking away. I'm throwing this away. Jesus said there are those who don't live victoriously anymore and have decided to live a different way. And there will be some who have made that decision and changed their decision from the day they began. 
He said, I will never erase some names from the book of life because they've stayed focused and they've remained faithful. That's why the book of Hebrews told people, don't drift. Don't drift. Stay faithful to God. The word used for drifting is a word that is used of a ring that's one or two sizes too big. And in the activity of the day, somehow the ring slips off. Before you know it, you've been separated from something very precious. Or it's used of a piece of earthenware in the kitchen that sprung a leak. In the beginning of the week, it's full of water and it's, it's doing what it should. But by the end of its season, it's as dry as a bone and all of that goodness has leaked out. That's the same word for drift. The other application of that same word in, in original language is when a boat is not tethered or anchored properly in a riverbank. And the power of the currents can take it down the river and remove it from its position of security and take it even out to sea. The writer said, be careful that you're properly anchored and moored. Be careful that you haven't sprung a leak and you were doing so well and now your spiritual life is dry and arid. Or you started with something so precious, you embraced the truth so wonderfully, but now we don't know where you are. Well, these aren't new thoughts. Jesus said there are those who respond to the word with joy. Isn't that true? In the sower sows the seeds, they respond with joy. But an emotional response to the gospel is not enough. Because when the heat came out and the sun began to shine, they withered up and died. Oh, we're not in a place at the moment, certainly not in this country, where such heat is on, but it's on its way. When I worked with Open Doors and we talked about opening up a rehabilitation center for Christians in the north of Nigeria who had suffered persecution, I realized then that we have to find that place of security by understanding who we're dealing with. We need roots. We need to know God for who he really is. This isn't any play-play thing we're dealing with. This isn't any feel-good issue we're dealing with. We need to serve him whether it's sunshine or rain. Are you hearing his voice tonight? I hope you are. I told you the father can take a life. The son will discipline people in that manner. The spirit too. Acts chapter 5 and an incredible time of worship. Peter said... How could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are outside the door. They will carry you out too. Instantly, in the middle of church service, she fell to the ground and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Here's the response in the church. Great fear gripped the entire church. Sorry, if you feel all of those texts about people losing their life and being disciplined under the hand of God was Old Testament. It's not. Judgment begins at the house of God. And it happened right here. I mean, how are many of you would join a church where such things happen? Where the deacons came and part of Sunday morning preparation was to count how many body bags will we need today? Would you go to that church? Would you go? Some of you are not sure now, right? <laughs> Let me tell you, it's too late. That's the only church he has. See, when he did it the first time, only two people died. If he were to do it in some place today, maybe only two people would be left standing. <laughs> I'm trying to get honest with you. I'm trying to get real. I can't imagine what it would be like for me to be in a church like that. And my children came home from Sunday church. And I said, how was church today? They said, oh, daddy, it was incredible. God killed two people in the offering. I don't know who's going to die next week. Can we go back again? Woo. We laugh a little bit because I, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable on Friday night. But seriously, there is only one church. That's how he behaves. I told you that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
have the capacity, if they need to, to take a life. And I'll tell you why I'm saying this, so that you understand it. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, we are told that we have been adopted into the household of God. And what a blessing and a privilege it is to be adopted, to feel that you're in a family. I never grew up with my family. I lived in foster care and children's homes and orphanages. I never had my own family until I got married and I had four children and the, a wife who was the love of my life. Absolutely. So I, I kind of gravitate to these texts where, where they're told of how God puts the lonely in families. And when your father and mother forsake you, Psalm 27 verse 10, the Lord will take you up. I've seen that happen in my own experience. So I'm reading the book of Romans with great intrigue that now we're adopted into God's family and the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God and we cry, Abba, Father. It's a wonderful thing. But you need to understand that adoption in the light of the culture in which Paul is writing. When it comes to the Roman culture and adoption, it's a very powerful thing. Uh, just for, for background's sake, a Roman father has complete authority over his household. It's known as patria potestas. And the, the authority that the father has over his children is so strong that if an act of discipline was required, and he thought it was so severe and so extreme, it required him to remove the life of the child, he could be legally affirmed for making that decision. Adoption did not change that. That was the power of a Roman father, with patria potestas. And when a child was adopted and moved from one family to another, there were a couple of ceremonies that had to take place before the magistrates. The first one called emancipatio, another one called vandicatio. But in the first ceremony, the child was placed on a stand and money was given to the child or for the child's life. And symbolically, the first parent could buy them back and redeem them back if they wanted to. They were asked by the judge, do you want to redeem your child? And they would put up money as a symbol. Their life is still in my hands. It happened three times. On the third time they were asked, they would not put any money on the table. And that meant that the patria potestas of the original father was now broken. He had given away that authority. The second process was when the new parent, the new father of the household said, I'm going to put a case to the magistrate, a compelling case that says I should become the new and adoptive parent. I will take on all the responsibility. I will erase the debts from that child's life. I will give them a new name. They will be fully installed in my family. They will become heirs, joint heirs with all of my other children. And you know, it, it's a wonderful thing because this all happened in front of seven witnesses of different ages. Older to younger. So that however long into the future the relationship of this child was to the new family, there was always somebody there who could say, listen, you're a member of this family. If the new father forgot, maybe he developed Alzheimer's. There was a witness that would say, mm -mm, I was there when the courts affirmed that this child is yours. They need to be given their part of the estate. They need to be given their share in the inheritance. If the child went, I can't remember if I'm as part of this family. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't feel I'm wanted. The witness will say, but you are. I was there when the courts affirmed the fact that you have made that transition. There's a witness. That's why the Bible says in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit. If you don't know that little bit of backdrop to Roman history and culture, you won't understand the significance of the Spirit of God telling you when you forget whose family you're in and who your father is. He witnesses to you. He reminds you of a transaction that took place in the courts of heaven that affirms you as a joint heir with Christ. Something happens when you get a revelation. It says that we cry, Abba, Father. And we don't just go, oh, thank you, Dark Father. No, this is a scream. This is a scream of faith. When Jesus was walking on the water and the disciples thought they saw a ghost, it says they screamed. The word is cried, Zion. Screamed. How do people scream when they think they saw a ghost? It's intense. 
But Romans 8 isn't saying you've seen a ghost. It's saying, I want to let you know who your father is. And when the revelation of who is your father hits your spirit, you cry, Abba, Father. So you need to be aware of who your daddy is and whose family you're in. But I'm telling you that the new father still has Patria Potestas. And if he needed to, he can sh- cut short a life. That's why Ananias and Sapphira died in Acts 5. That's why some people died, because of their foolish behavior at a communion service where people were greedy and drunken in 1 Corinthians 11. And God said, this is inappropriate behavior amongst my people. There's a false prophetess confusing my people. There are people acting in all kinds of compromised moral states. Listen, I have Patria Potestas. I still have the power to say your life ends tonight. Friends, if you, like Jesus said, can be afraid and have honor and respect for one who's able to do that, your lifestyle will take a change. But in our churches, because we don't preach these things, we get a very different kind of lifestyle amongst the people. Listen, friends, if you want to hear the voice of God, you've got to acknowledge that the will of God has to be done. And that he has to be feared and honored. I I, I want to... Speak some more over this weekend about who he is and what he's like and how you can hear his voice. But as an opening session tonight, the will of God is very key. The voice of God will always lead to the will of God. The voice of God will always lead, secondly, to the worship of the Son. It's clear in Scripture that the greatest desire of both the Father and the Spirit is to see the Son, Jesus, honored and exalted. Any voice or word that claims to be from God will point to the worship of Jesus alone. Anybody moving by the Spirit of God will always say, Jesus is Lord. It doesn't put the spotlight of attention on anybody else, the worship of the Son. Thirdly, the Word of the Spirit. Any reliable way, there is no other reliable way to discern God's voice other than to see whether what you're hearing or what you're being told aligns with The scriptures. Ezekiel 36 verse 27. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Oh my gosh. The ignorance of God's people is going to destroy them. It's not that God's people are destroyed through their sin. In fact, the writer of the scriptures, the prophetic writer said this. My people are destroyed through a lack of knowledge. It will be the ignorance of God's people that will make them their most vulnerable. And so our times of devotional habit, which are so superficial, we snack a little bit, we read something on the train, half asleep on the way to work. We say a quick prayer before we go to bed, Lord Jesus, keep me as I sleep this night. Amen. You think that's enough? No, seriously, you think, you think that's enough? So when people are really challenged to understand the scriptures, they don't know what to say. When some smart person is able to twist the scriptures or misrepresent them, you don't know enough of the scriptures to correct it. So either we get deceived or we just keep silent because we don't know how to communicate the real voice.